Good evening, everyone. So exciting. Oh, am I excited? A couple of things. I'm always excited to come on and talk to everybody. I know everybody has lots of questions about um, cancer, and we're going to be talking about mast cell tumor. Um, so, um, and we just did, we didn't finish it. So last month, I've been trying to do things uh, themed. So that way, if you have questions, you can always come back and more easily find your answers to your questions about a specific topic. So in January, we did a live event on dog lymphoma. Um, we in February we did cat lymphoma, and then in March we did dog mast cell tumor. And it's one of the most common skin tumors that we see in dogs. Um, and you know there was a lot of questions, and I just feel like we really didn't get to everything. So we decided that we were going to do our next talk, which is this one, our next event on mast cell tumors. We haven't completely decided, but I am leaning towards osteosarcoma for the month of May. I cannot believe it is almost May yet, um, which is also uh, Cancer Awareness Month. There's two Cancer Awareness Months, um, May and November. Uh, so I think we'll be doing osteosarcoma, and I'm really excited because we can start talk a little bit about the vaccine um, that is in trials and um, rolling out across the country, which is really exciting. Um, but again, we are going to be talking about mast cell tumors, and I see that some people are jumping on, so I'm super excited. Thank you, everybody, for joining me. Uh, it's Thursday, which is typically my Friday, so TGIT, I am off tomorrow. I have a lot of work to be doing from home, but I'm excited that I can stay in my jammies <laughs> for a little bit longer. Um, so uh, welcome everybody. Um, I see that Jenny is here and Cheryl. Hey guys, I really appreciate you taking the time to join in. Um, and yes, Denise, I see that you, um, yep, I have your question, Denise. So that it wasn't approved by admin. So um, my friend Caitlin is on. So hopefully um, if there are anything coming in that needs to be approved, which don't typically need to, um, we will hopefully get that resolved. But we do have a good number of questions, and I you know, appreciate everybody's time, and I don't want to waste your time. So we're going to dive in um, and start um, you know, talk, doing some of the questions. Hey, Angel, um, thanks for joining. Yes, great. I, I think osteosarcoma will be a good one for us next month. Um, but let's dive in and let's talk about it. So overview, we're talking about dog mast cell tumors, one of the most common malignant skin cancers that we see. And you know, before I talk about and answer your questions, I have to just remind everybody a couple of things. You know, all mast cell tumors are not created equal. One size does not fit all. So there are some mast cell tumors which are, even though they're malignant, less aggressive and you know surgery especially if we find them when they're small will be curative for these many mast cell tumors and they have a low rate of metastasis and many dogs won't need uh, chemotherapy afterwards so that's great but then there's also the higher grade ones the grade three or high grade or some of the grade two which have a greater chance of metastasis and so for the high grade ones you know they have a 50 to 90 percent chance of metastasis and then the middle grade from the old grading system about a 50-50 chance of metastasizing. So again, one size does not fit all. And you know that I'm going to talk about early cancer detection. And so I can't look at a mass. Your veterinarian can't look at a mass. Um, you know, I always say my mom can't snap a picture of a lump and bump from one of our Labradors and send it to me. We can't know what it is. So it's really important that once a month, guys, on your calendar, you know, just like when you're giving your monthly heartworm preventative, you want to make a day where you are actively palpating and feeling your dog's um, lumps and bumps and pr some pretty cool, exciting things we have um, on the website where I'm in the middle of redoing my website, we will have skin maps. So you will be able to go to my website, drsuecancerfet.com, not yet, um, and download your own skin map. And we, you will be able to keep track of those lumps and bumps where they are. So when you go into your veterinarian for those monthly exams and you're concerned about a lump or bump, you can point them out to them and they can aspirate them. So again, that's the key is we can't look at a mass and know what it is. So please go to your veterinarian and do an aspirate. And that's where we stick a needle in, extract some cells, put them on a microscope slide, um, and then we typically send them off to the lab for diagnosis. Mast cell tumors are usually one of the ones that we can pretty easily and accurately diagnose with cytology, um, and many vets are comfortable in-house, but sometimes we need to send them out, and I like to send them out. 
There's a cool thing in the works, guys, where I'm actually working with a company called Lacuna Diagnostics for digital, almost on-demand cytology. So we will digitally scan the slide in my clinic and then send it off into the cloud. And then a board-certified cytologist is looking at it in about an hour from when we upload it and we're getting our report. So that is super, super cool. And it's just going to increase, you know, how quickly we're getting results back and, you know, we're all anxious, right? You want to know if your pet has cancer. So again, some cool things in the work. Um, like I said, I'm working with a great company, Lacuna Diagnostics, um, and they're rolling out this digital on-demand cytology. So that is super exciting. All right. So that's sort of the overview about mast cell tumors. Some, you know, will be cured with surgery and have a very low chance of um, metastasizing. And some of them will be more aggressive, but they're still a very treatable cancer. I'm going to say that again. Mast cell tumors are a very treatable cancer. So let's get the information and, you know, go see an oncologist if you can. Um, some of the links that I usually throw in almost every um, event that we do is vetspecialist.com. You can put in your zip code. We'll throw that in the comments and you can hopefully find a specialist near you um, to really guide you through this one. Because like I said, one size does not fit all and my mom's dog's mast cell tumor can be very different than my cousin Lainey's dog. Um, Maggie or Sammy had a mast cell tumor. Maggie had a mast cell tumor too. Um, and Sammy's was really aggressive and Maggie's was not. So again, early ident identification and then get the information. So um, Angel, I'm just looking at the last comment. When will the digital cytology be available to other practices? Absolutely. So Lacuna Diagnostics um, is the website. Really cool company um, started by two veterinary students at Colorado State who um, really blown away by this. So um, you can look into that and um, we can definitely get you more information. So like I said, I'm in one of the pilot programs and we're just trying to make sure everything is working smoothly and so far it has been. So that is really, really cool. So um, I think what I'm going to do is start with some of the questions that were asked yesterday and the day before on the event page, um, and then I'll kind of scroll back and go through the comments from today um, <clears throat> and see what we got. So doo -doo -doo, we'll start here. Um, Wendy said, how soon after starting Palladia should you see a reduction in a tumor and or histamine reaction around the tumor? Is there a point when you can deem it not working? So that's a great question. That's Wendy um, from Canada. And so, so we're all on the same page. Palladia is an oral chemotherapy drug that's been on the market now for about 10 years. Uh, it's very, um, it was very exciting when it first came out, still exciting because it's different than a way a lot of the uh, traditional chemo works in that this is targeted therapy and it works best in dogs with mast cell tumors that have a genetic mutation. Um, and so it's called a C-kit mutation. So the way that I think about it, I always try to make analogies to human cancers. We know some women with breast cancer have like the BRCA gene mutation. So we know that about a third of dogs with mast cell tumors mast cell tumors um, have the C-kit mutation and Palladia targets that C-kit mutation. It's more effective in dogs with the mutation than without the mutation, but it can work in both dogs that are mutation positive and mutation negative. So in general, if I have the funds and the means to, I will, I do like to find out if dogs have that C-kit mutation. How do we do that? It's pretty easy, actually. You can just submit that sample that's already been to the lab for biopsy. Um, and uh, usually we send it to Colorado State or Michigan State. They're the two main labs, and they're testing um, the sample for the mutation. About 70% of dogs with um, that have the mutation, they have a higher response rate with um, Palladia, um, and if, about 40% response rate if they don't have the mutation. So a question is good. So how soon will you see a reduction? In general, I like to see... Um, I tell owners to give me about four to six to eight weeks before we can say if it's effective. So it doesn't zap and shrink the tumor instantaneously. It does take time to see that regression. Um, if I'm seeing progression in the first couple of weeks, I might give it a couple more weeks. But um, again, usually I would like to see stabilization or regression within, again, the four to six to eight week range. Um, and again, if you're seeing it stay stable and you haven't tried other things, you might want to try something else. So that's where I may go to vimblastine or lomustine. Um, you know, steroids can have a role in treating mast cell tumors as well. So, um, so that is basically what I think about with Palladia. 
The other thing that we really know from the original Palladia study, which was done by one of my brilliant fellow oncologists, Dr. Cheryl London, is that it's, you know, and this is really true for lots of, of lots of cancers. In general, monotherapy, one drug, doesn't do as well as multiple therapy. So, you know, we know that in general, all the mast cell tumors are not going to melt away with Palladia. So typically when I'm thinking about using uh, Palladia, even if I know the dog has the mutation, I typically, and again, you'll see some variation, I like to do two months of steroids with injectable vinblastine, where I'm trying to sh shrink the tumor to have a different mechanism of action, and then I'll switch over to Palladia and is depending on how we're using it, I usually tell the owners to plan on being on Palladia for four to six months. So at least six months of chemotherapy total. There are some cases where we may go straight to Palladia, but I have seen better response rates when I do Vimblastine first and then Palladia. There are some studies now that are looking at using the two of them together, but as you can imagine, we might need to be lowering the dose due to toxicity. So again, in general, I do Vimblastine with steroids and then I'll go on to Palladia. So again, you know, if you're not seeing that response. But if you're not seeing a response within two weeks and the, the patient's tolerating it, by all means, I would keep going. Usually, um, you know, I see them back every two weeks for about two visits. So get us through the first month as long as the patient's not losing weight and eating well and not having any, you know, negative side effects like vomiting or diarrhea or things like that. Then I start to go to monthly appointments. Usually when we're on it about two months again, that's when I'm going to want to see a good response. And then if not, I may um, change at that. But if you're seeing rapid progression, you may need to change earlier. So Wendy, hopefully that answers your question. I'm not sure if you're on. Um, I'll look for you in the comment section, but let me know if you have any more questions on that. Hey, Tiffany. Hey, Rebecca. So uh, thanks to all my friends. It's always great to see some familiar names there um, and Jenny as well. So guys, I appreciate you coming out on your Thursday night to join me. Um, all right. So Courtney from Florida has a dog. Her dog has mast cell tumor high grade two, low three. So we'll come back to that. Um, it's only on her back leg. She's on Palladia since December, so about four months. Uh, within the first week, they started to shrink, so that's great. Like I said, it can take longer to see that shrink. After that, they stayed the same for quite some time. They tried increasing the dose. Now they're getting bigger. So this is actually a good question because it really ties into what we were talking about. So, you know, a lot of times you will see an initial response, but then maybe the tumor can develop resistance. So um, it seems like you had a really good initial response within the first week or so, and then they stabilized. Um, in general, Palladia is different than, because it's a targeted therapy, than some of the other drugs we're often giving more is not, um, you're not always going to get a better response. And again, um, Lots of chemotherapy, we worry about dose reductions that will lose efficacy. But again, with these targeted therapies, um, less is not always worse. So um, increase the dose, and now they're getting bigger. So yeah, I would change. And again, general recommendations without actually having looked at the patient and looked at the medical record, but just sort of as an overall concept, if the tumor is now getting bigger, I would think about different therapy. Again, the other two main drugs. Hey, Wendy, I'm glad that you're here, and hopefully that information helped you. Um, but again, I love vimblastine. Um, steroids are another good one. Often steroids with vimblastine work well together. And then low mustine is another good one. A few other drugs that may be used for mast cell tumors include cyclophosphamide. Um, sometimes we'll use an older chemotherapy drug called hydroxyurea, which is an oral one. Um, but those are sort of the main um, contenders for when we're treating um, mast cell tumors. So hopefully that helps. And I like those questions because I kind of tied together and I didn't even realize I was doing that. So um, we're going to keep trucking along. Um, let's see why we're here. Any thoughts on the use of Benadryl Pepsid or natural equivalents? So this is a question from Mike. Hey, Mike, how are you? Um, on a dog. Um, hey, Gail. Sorry. I'm tired. My eyes are tired. Has anyone had a really long week? I've had a really long week. So like I said, I'm really glad this is the end of my week. So, okay, back to Mike. Mike, you want to know about Benadryl or Pepsid or natural equivalents on a dog that has one mast cell tumor, low level, grade two, with no signs of recurrence, nine months post-op. How do you decide if they need to continue their antihistamines? That's a great question. And I think this is one that often confuses a lot of people and sometimes uh, veterinary professionals as well. So 
What's with mast cell tumors and needing antihistamines and antacids? So the mast cell tumor itself within the cell contains little granules, almost like little storage uh, capsules of histamines um, and um, and some other things like heparin, which is a blood thinner, and a bunch of other inflammatory things. So when it gets released, it causes inflammation. So that is why your dog may have a mast cell tumor on the arm, on the side, um, and they may sit down on your hard tile floor, or they may scratch at it or itch at it, and it gets bigger. And then as the histamine and all those inflammatory substances are getting absorbed back into the body, the mass will get smaller. And it's really confusing, right? Because you wouldn't think, oh, if my dog had a mass or tumor, it wouldn't get bigger and smaller on its own. So the tumor itself is not growing. It's that, that inflammatory release with the histamines. So as histamines get absorbed into the dog's body, um, it, you know, after that local inflammation, so, you know, it gets the redness and all the swelling may go away. Um, it can actually, the histamines can cause an increase in stomach acidity. And so that upsets their stomach. And so sometimes dogs with mast cell tumors will not want to eat or they'll be vomiting. And sometimes there'll be a little bit of blood in their vomit. So that is why if they have what we call measurable tumor, if your dog has a big mast cell tumor and hasn't gotten taken off, or if your dog has mast cell tumor that has metastasized internally, commonly to the liver and spleen, and in most advanced cases, the bone marrow, and sometimes a draining lymph node. So one on the arm may go to the lymph node by the shoulder or under the armpit. Um, but if a dog has a mast cell tumor that you can see, or you can see on different testing, we're going to put that dog in antihistamines. You're going to put that dog on Pepsid or an antacid. Sometimes I use a Meprazole as well. Um, which is another stomach protectant. So, but if the dog has no evidence of spread and the tumor's been removed, I don't necessarily keep them on those medications. So for Mike, for your question, it sounds like your dog had the tumor removed um, and no signs of recurrence. I don't, I don't usually keep them on those medications. Um, I usually reserve those for dogs, like I said, that before the tumor has come off or if their cancer has spread. Um, so Mike, talk to your veterinarian. Um, obviously I'm not going to make, you know, specific medical advice over the interwebs. Um, but again, I typically would get them off at that point. Does that help Mike? I hope so. Um, anything specific about that before? Uh, yes, correct. So Mike, hopefully that answered your question. Um, and I'm going to probably answer another question from the pre-asked questions and then we'll try to bounce back and forth. Like I said, I'm gonna to try to get through so many questions. Bernardo says, so many questions, so many doubt. I'm eager to learn more about this horrid tumor. Yeah, and so it's hard, like I said, because some dogs have mast cell tumors that are really easily manageable and some of them can be much more aggressive. And so again, the big thing is to find them early, make sure they haven't spread and then figure out, you know, how aggressive your dog's therapy used to be, needs to be. Um, but again, you know, some of these dogs with mast cell tumors can do really, really well. One of my sort of famous loving cases was a dog named Bruno who passed away last year um, in 2017. And his first mast cell tumor, one of many, was in 2008. Um, and in 2015, he developed osteosarcoma um, and lived over two years with that cancer as well. And one of his lumps and bumps that I aspirated thinking he would have another mast cell tumor, turned out to be a soft tissue sarcoma, connective tissue cancer, not a mast cell tumor, even though he had many mast cell tumors. He had about one a year. Most of his were low grade. Um, but again, there was another one and I looked at it, I was like, oh, Bruno, another mast cell tumor. And it was a soft tissue sarcoma. So again, it does goes to show you that you can't really tell what it is by looking at it. And um, veterinarians call mast cell tumors the great impersonator is that you just can't look at them and they can look like other things. So again, go to your vet, Let's stick some needles in it and look at those cells under the microscope. They're actually kind of pretty, and I know that's where I'm a weird person, but um, I do like cytology and the mast cell tumors. We can uh, post one in the comments later. Um, but like I said, most veterinarians um, know what they look like, and if not, we'll send them to the lab to confirm. So uh, Fernando, hopefully this information will make you feel better. Um, you know, I always think information is power. And so it's really good to learn about it. And again, just remember that one dog's mast cell tumor can be very good, very good, can be very different than another dog's mast cell tumor. So again, don't get scared. Just let's, let's get knowledgeable about it and let's get smart about it. 
Um, Dana asked, what causes mast cell tumors in dogs? And that's a great question. And unfortunately, in most cancers, we don't know what causes them. Um, in general, cancer is a disease of age. So that's one of the risk factors, right? We know that older people and older dogs are at greater risk. But mast cell tumors is definitely one of the cancers that even though we see in middle-aged and older dogs, we can see in younger dogs as well. Um, just a few years ago, I saw it in a Labrador. And if any of you know me, you know I'm a Labrador lover. Um, it was on the paw and it was a six month old lab. So real thanks, Fernando. Glad you're here. It was, you know, I mean, cancer in, in a dog of any age sucks, but something about a puppy just seems really, really cruel and unfair. Um, so it, it doesn't discriminate by age. You know, people have looked into whether chronic skin inflammation or skin um, allergies or things, but there hasn't been a specific link to the cause of mast cell tumors, unfortunately. But again, the good thing about them is they're something that we can see and feel, right? You know, bone cancer is harder. It's internal. Hemangiosarcoma of the spleen, that malignant cancer of blood vessels, it's internal. So again, we, guys, we can do something about this. We can be proactive with our pets. We can take it upon ourselves to feel them monthly for lumps and bumps, you know, and especially female dogs, you know, you want to feel the mammary chain. Their dogs have 10 mammary, um, you know, glands on both sides. So feel them. Know your dog. You know, if you're a cat owner and you're listening, you have cats too. Same thing. You want to feel our pets once a month and anything. So my guidelines are, if you haven't heard them, see something, do something. Why wait? Aspirate. And so if the mass is the size of a pea and been there a month, go to your veterinarian and get an aspirate because it's the only way we're going to find out what it is and early detection definitely saves lives. So I feel really passionate about this and you know my friends that are here know this and they hear me talk about it all the time. So um, no age discrimination. No, it is. It's it's a it's it's tough. You know, um, it's and it's frustrating. But like I said, something about you know, I, I just saw a five year old dog yesterday with lymphoma. Just a, a pity and. You know, she's sick and just wagging her tail and just it's it, it can be it can be really, really hard to be uh, to do what we do some days. Um, anything topical on a small mass cell tumor that is oozing? Should I clean it or leave it alone? So, Anna, I have to tell you, that's a hard question to an answer over the phone. And that's one where you probably want to go to your veterinarian um, if it's getting infected. Sometimes uh, antibiotics will definitely help. Um, you know, you don't want that infection to get internal um, but you know, whether a topical one, it's really hard for me to say, I don't use a ton of topical antibiotics. I usually, um, would put them on oral antibiotics. So I would go to your veterinarian, have them take a look at it and see what they think. And then a lot of the times is mast cell tumors can be really itchy. And then we know that the histamines and stuff, so dogs lick at them, they scratch them. So often it's a matter of also keeping them away. You don't want to cover them up, especially if they're oozing because air can be good for them. But you know, e-collars, socks, you know, at time to cover it. If it's on a leg, you really need to keep the pet away from it because they can do a lot of damage in a very short period of time. Um, okay. So what else have we got going on here? Um, what is your opinion on chemotherapy? So Janet wants to know, um, what is my opinion on chemotherapy for a high grade mast cell tumor? Um, specifically palladia to side, side effects. So Janet, you know, we talked about that um, for the first question, um, which I believe was Wendy's question. So um, I think, you know, before I personally use palladia, I really like to um, find out if they have the mutation. If they don't have the mutation, I usually save palladia as sort of my plan B, plan C protocol. I do like palladia a lot, but again, I don't often rely on it as a single therapy. So again, I'm often doing zimblastine and pred and then going to palladia. And then if they don't have the mutation, I'm often combining um, my Limblastine PRED protocol with lomustine, which is another oral chemotherapy. Palladia is a little bit different in the sense that that's that targeted therapy. That's one that owners are usually giving at home every other day or three times a week. Lomustine, even though I said it's oral, um, it's one that in my clinic, we have you come in, we check blood work, and then we give it, and then they go home. Um, you may be asked to give it at home after blood work is run and they get back, um, but in general, in my practice, we're just going to give it a little safer and then you don't have to deal with it at home. Uh, so that's typically um, how we'll do it. So again, Janet, good question. So, um, you know, and just to kind of go back to those, those grade three, those high grade mast cell tumors, because those, you know, those are the ones that are more aggressive, but, you know, studies show that even with, you still want to remove the tumor, 
Um, and ideally with mast cell tumors, what's really important and why it's so important to find them smaller is clean wide margins. What the heck do I mean by that? So you need to get in general about two centimeters. Where are my calipers? Um, okay, got them. Never far. All right, here are my uh, Dr. Sue calipers. So you want to get two centimeters around um, the mast cell tumor. So let's get this thing on and good to go. So if your dog has a two centimeter mast cell tumor, that's obviously a kid, two centimeters right here, that's not that big, right? Remember I said ideally we want to find them when they're one centimeter. That's the size of a pea, same as the size of an M&M or a Skittle. So if your dog has a two centimeter mast cell tumor, in general, for those lower grade ones, you're going to want to get two to three centimeters around it. So that's another six. So we need to go up to eight centimeters. Um, it's about eight centimeters. That's how big your dog's incision should be when they come home to get those clean and wide margins. So that's why it's so important. So you can imagine if your dog's tumor was, was six centimeters, it needs to have another, you know, six centimeters on both sides. So now we're going up to like 12 centimeters. So your dog should come home with a really big, um, you know, really big incision. So again, find them smaller. But for those high grade tumors, in addition to removing them, sometimes we'll use radiation. They need chemotherapy as well. But those dogs can still go on, and depending on you know the different specifics of the case, some studies of survival times is a year. And I know you're like, Sue, that's not enough time. And it's not, but for an aggressive tumor where in some cases without treatment the dog may only live months, a year, it's not you know, it's not horrible. And let's think about how, you know, a year is a significant portion of a dog's life, you know, especially for these large breed dogs where their lifespan may be 12, 13, 14 years. So again, you know, um, you know, I, I think there are options even for dogs with high grade mast cell tumors, even dogs that come in with metastasis internally, they need a little bit more supportive care. So go to go back to Mike's question, that's a dog that I'm going to keep on Benadryl. And that's a dog that I'm going to have on, you know, Pepsid or Meprazole or something like that. So um, that's sort of my approach with that. Um, so Dana wants to know which is better surgical procedure to remove. Um, so in general, she wants to know should you remove with lasers or with scalpels. We just need to make sure that the, whatever, usually we don't use lasers because it can disturb the margins and the ability to tell if there are mast cell tumors at the cut edge. So typically the surgeons are removing them with a scalpel procedure. Um, Hey, Dara. So one of my uh, intern mates back from the Animal Medical Center just joined. Good to see you. Um, is there a diet that is good for dogs with mast cell tumors? Says Courtney. There was another diet question. Courtney, I promise you I will come back to that. But there was a question that I saw from Heather. It says, my dog seems to be clustering with tumor development. We've been catching them at pinpoint sizes, um, and they're too small to aspirate. So we usually punch them out, which leads to incomplete margins. Any advice? We don't want to wait for them to get bigger. So I love your proactive approach. Um, there are definitely some dogs that, you know, I was mentioning Bruno. He had about a mast cell tumor a year. Our approach was aspirated, find out what it is, make his first surgery the only surgery. So we knew that it was a mast cell tumor. We knew that our margins needed to be bigger, bigger surgical approach than if it was something benign that we could be less aggressive with. Um, but he did about one a year, so it wasn't really a big deal. There are some dogs that cluster, and I use the exact same term, Heather, where um, they will make multiple mast cell tumors. And so I had one dog, her name was 20, I kid you not, and when she first came in, she had over 10 mast cell tumors. So we took off two, and then we put her on chemotherapy. So Heather, depending depending on how quickly, you know, there are some dogs that it's just like, if I keep cutting these off, they're, we're going to be doing surgery all the time. We're going to keep doing these punch biopsies. So that might be a case where I would go to something systemic. I would try chemotherapy um, because maybe that would prevent them from popping up and then you wouldn't have to go through all that. Um, but, you know, a punch biopsy, I think if you have a dog that is developing multiple mast cell tumors in such a short time period, you can't keep going in and doing big surgeries to get margin. So, you know, yes, the punch biopsy to find out what they are is a reasonable approach, but it sounds like 
you know, for me, if I have a dog that has three mast cell tumors in six months, they just keep popping up or, has, you know, five when they come in to me, that's a dog that I need to think about something systemic. And when I say systemic, I mean chemotherapy. Could be oral chemotherapy, could be injectable chemotherapy. It could be a combination of both of those. Um, and again, you know, I like to send one of them off for the mast cell tumor panel, which helps me, like, try to predict how aggressive this is gonna be, and that usually includes the CKIT mutation. So we can, again, figure out if we're gonna do Palladia in our protocol. So um, Heather, it's a great question. Um, and again, I would talk to your oncologist about um, something systemic in my humble opinion. Um, let's see, Nick, your dog, Gracie has a mast cell tumor. Hey, Nick, contemplating surgery, but I'm worried about the histamine release during surgery and have the tumor spread. Um, considering holistic, what are your recommendations? She's eating a keto diet. Okay, we'll come back to keto diet. Um, and she's on Benadryl. So get that thing off, seriously, because she may have a low-grade mast cell tumor, Gracie, and you want to cut it off while it's small. Um, it's one of these urban legends that removing it will cause it to spread. Um, but again, she may have a low-grade mast cell tumor. You're going to do it, and it's not going to have spread, and she will just need monitoring and not need chemotherapy. Um, the histamine release can happen, especially for these large, the higher grade mast cell tumors. Those are the ones that are ulcerated and red and inflamed and we call them hot, ugly tumors. Um, you're going to pretreat. You're going to, you they may have, if your dog's on Benadryl now, they're probably going to also give some injectable Benadryl at the time of surgery. They're going to monitor her blood pressure, make sure she doesn't have any low blood pressure issues and things like that. So in my humble opinion, get it off while it's small. Um, because again, surgery can be curative for a lot of these low grade mast cell tumors. And if you can get them off with margins then we don't need radiation to clean up the, the area, um, and prevent regrowth. So again, my, um, strong encouragement is to get Gracie's tumor off Nick. Um, I know it's scary. I absolutely know. Um, my dog just had, you know, TPLO surgery, um, on Valentine's day and she had a mass taken off in... August. And so you guys can watch those. So I have some blogs of uh, Matilda's surgery. So if you're looking to see what a skin tissue surgery looks like, um, go back to my blog this summer that's in YouTube. And so um, we can put the link in there. Hers turned out not to be cancer. So it was a little bit of a cool story, but we thought she had a soft tissue sarcoma. Um, but you can see exactly what the surgery is like, the recovery and things like that. Um, and she has an eight centimeter. So I was showing you, you know, um, she had a pretty big um, scar for her mass. So, um, A, and why I'm bringing it up, guys, let me tell you about my YouTube channel because I've been working on this for about a year. So these videos will end up on YouTube. So it's another great place if you want to go back. If you missed the first mast cell tumor one, you can go and you can watch the first one and, you know, learn more information. Fernando, I know you're trying to learn more information. So that's another great resource. And then once a week, every other week, I'm posting vlogs on my patients getting chemo and, you know, really go and see how happy these chemotherapy patients are. They're coming in, they're wagging their tails, um, and just some of the things that go on when they come into the clinic. So, um, and while you're there, if you'd be so lovely as to, um, you know, subscribe to my YouTube channel, that would make me super excited as well. But again, lots of good information there. Um, and it, you know, hopefully what I'm trying to do with these videos is show you what it's like for chemo patients dogs and cats to come in. Um, there's ones of my Matilda getting x-rays. So you can kind of see what goes on behind closed doors. So if you're wondering like, what is it like when my dog is getting chemo? This is where you can go to find some good information. And so, um, and I have a great team and you know, it's my nurses and my assistant who really rock because they help me take care of my patients. So you'll get to meet my, my current team and my team when I was um, at a different hospital in the Hudson Valley. So um, shout out to any of the nurses that are on because I love you guys and my assistant, you guys rock. And behind every good um, veterinarian is a couple of good technicians keeping us um, moving and keeping us uh, you know, helping us take care of our patients, our patients. So shout out to all the veterinary technicians, veterinary nurses and assistants, um, and everybody at a veterinary hospital who really helps take care of the patients because you guys rock. Um, sorry, I got sidetracked. Um, all right. So let's see what other questions we have. Um, Jody, two previous surgery. Is it okay to do surgery again? Yeah. So when you say recently, Jody, 
you, ha you have to have a discussion with your oncologist about how quickly they're developing mast cell tumors. Again, one a year, I'm going to take, you know, I'm going to continue to do surgery, make sure they're all low grade, make sure they haven't metastasized or spread. And that's good. But if you're, you know, month three and you're going to surgery once a month, that may be a point where I'm going to stop surgery and consider something systemic because it seems like your pet has a propensity to make multiple mast cell tumors in a very short period. But can they be anesthetized? Yeah. You know, for radi some of these radiation cases, we anesthetize them daily, um, you know, and so it's okay. But again, I just, we want to make sure that it's the right approach because if your dog is making, making multiple mast cell tumors it might not be the best thing. Um, there was a couple of questions about diet um, and what should we feed for mast cell tumors. And I'll be honest, guys, it's a great question and we don't know the right answers. And if you start Googling, you'll find some pretty strong opinions, um, you know, pretty strong opinions for they were two years apart. So, Jody, if they were two years apart, yes, take it off, do surgery. But good reminder, you have to submit each mast cell tumor, especially if it's every two years, you have to submit them to the lab because your dog may have a high grade one and then a low grade one or a low grade one, grade one, grade two, and the next one is going to be high grade. And so if your dog had one two years ago and you have a new one, I'm going to submit it. Um, I just had a patient, Mackenzie. I think it's been two years since she had a couple of mast cell tumors and we treated her with chemo. She had a new one and we just got the slides to send it off for the mast cell tumor panel. So uh, definitely do surgery, but submit it. Find out the grade. Have your vet talk to you about the margins. The other thing they're going to look at on the biopsy report is the mitotic index. What the heck is that, Dr. Sue? That is how many of the cancer cells are dividing. Higher mitotic rate or index. Mitotic index has been associated with a shorter prognosis and a lower mitotic index has been associated with a longer prognosis. The difference between two and a half years and a couple of months. So again, not one thing should ever condemn a pet or say I don't have anything to worry about, but we're gonna put all those pieces of the puzzle together. That's what my job is. That's what the oncologist's job is to put all those pieces together um, and help you, you know, guide you through this process. Because, you know, as Fernando said, it's horrid and you're scared. So I totally get that, guys, but I want you to know there's hope with this cancer. Um, going back to diet. So a lot of people wonder about a keto diet, you know, and this goes back to some work, gosh, probably around the time I was a resident, which was a while ago, that, um, you know, we know that cancer cells require sugar, glucose, as their energy source. So should they be on what I say like an Atkins-like diet, which is high in proteins and high in fats and low in carbs? Mixed results, and there's not a lot of good studies about it. Um, I'm not a huge fan for or against it, so I don't have a strong opinion about it. If I have a strong opinion about something, you'll know. Um, I also think any you know changes to your pet's diet, especially if they are on chemo or other things, you should um, talk that over with your veterinarian. In terms of a raw food diet, again, you will get very strong opinions. So what are the concerns with raw, fo raw food diets? You know, the negatives that people are concerned about. Uh, thank you, Jasmine. Um, the um, concerns with um, a, I hear my son's outside the door, so they might come in to say goodnight. Goodnight, guys. Um, is, is bacterial contamination. So if you have a patient that's on chemo and they're potentially immunocompromised, do you want them on a raw diet? This is my, my personal opinion. Just going to say it. So if your pet is already on a raw diet and we're starting chemotherapy, I don't take them off of it. I leave them on it. You know, owners, obviously you need to take precautions, wash hands, keep it away from other, you know, foods in the house and stuff like that. But I'll be honest, right? We see a lot of contamination with commercial diets and cooked diets as well. So I don't think there's a perfect, you know, solution in that you can say all cooked diets are safe and all raw diets are bad. But again, I would prefer if a patient who has not been on a raw diet and is starting chemotherapy does not start start a raw diet at that time. That's how I handle my cases, but I work with the clients, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, yeah, and so, you know, and some people do it, and that's totally fine. And like I said, if I have a strong opinion, yay or nay, I will let you know. With high-protein diets, do you worry about kidney function? No, I don't, and if your pet has kidney issues, that's definitely you want to talk to, you know, if they have um, kidney disease, whether it's early kidney, kidney disease, where they often do put them on a low protein diet, please talk to your veterinarian. Um, when I have cases like that, I often get a nutritionist involved. And so we'll do a nutrition consult. And so there are some of our um, 
consults or some of the nutritionists will do phone consults. I work with um, one who's up at Cornell. Um, and then there's also one in the New Jersey area if a client wants to meet them one-on-one. -on -one. So those are going to be, you know, cases where you're going to be like, you know what, we have a couple of conflicting things going on. Let's get a nutritionist on board. And then we can try to reconcile the two things. But in general, for the average healthy dog, high protein, um, you know, higher fat diet, lower carb diet is going to be okay. Um, all right, I do want to try to scroll up to some of the earlier questions. If I missed your question, feel free to type it again so I don't have to scroll up. Um, but let's see, Rachel, what is your advice for a young dog diagnosed with mast cell uh, for long-term care? So your uh, chocolate lab, you had me at Labrador, sweetie, uh, was diagnosed under a, under a year old. So again, one of those young dogs that we were talking about, grade two, low mitotic index. So that's good. So that's a great question. So Let's, let's go to the, the good mast cell tumor cases in the sense that you have a dog with a small, ideal situation, small, uh, low grade, you know, mast cell tumor, grade one, grade two, or low grade, depending on the two grading systems that we use, and a low mitotic index. I still do the mast cell tumor panel, gives me a couple of more sort of molecular uh, ways of looking at how aggressive the cancer could be, including the C-kit mutation. But let's assume it all came back low, C-kit mutation negative, we're excited. How do I monitor those cases? I have them come back every three months for the first year. Um, I'm doing ultrasounds because the most common places that this cancer spreads is the liver and spleen. Um, and I'm feeling the, the site, say it was on the arm, that you know the body wall or something like that. I'm feeling it for recurrence. And obviously, we're going to be encouraging that our pet owners do that as well. The um, other thing that we will, um, once we get to the one-year anniversary, I start to stretch them out to every four months. My goal is to get them out every six months. Um, but again, what, that was the recommendation when I was a resident at Bal I'll be honest, when I think about how dogs age, six months is a really long time for me. So I try to go out to every four months. But again, ultrasounds, monitoring for new lumps and bumps, aspirating them if you find them, um, feeling the, uh, the site for recurrence. Um, and that's how I, you know, I think about monitoring these guys. One of the questions that came up um, from the, the questions before the thing was, what about supplements? So Candace had asked this, and there was another question about that. And guys, it's confusing. There's a lot of supplements out there. And a lot of the times when you Google, you like you're reading a page and then you realize it's the supplements website. So again, I have a few that are my preference, but there are some good ones out, you know, good ones out there. And there's a lot out there. And Mike, you brought this up like a holistic, I think it was Mike, a holistic approach. I'm not a holistic veterinarian. I believe in an integrative approach where we're going to use Eastern and Western medicine, but I only have, you know, experience with some. So a lot of the times if owners want a really strong holistic influence, I'm going to partner and work side by side with one of the holistic vets in my area. So again, a good integrative approach is good. Uh, Debbie, I'm going to come back to your one about the mitotic index. Um, supplements that I like, um, I like Apicaps. Um, which is an all-natural um, plant-derived supplement um, that was developed by the co-author of my book, The Dog Cancer Survival Guide. Been using that in my patients probably since 2012. It has natural anti-inflammatory effects. So if your dog is on steroids, prednisone for its mast cell tumor, I wait till they're off steroids before I add apicaps. I do like, for the immune support, I like the mushrooms. Um, so I like... Um, I use Canine Immunity Plus, so that was one of the questions that um, Candace had asked. Digestive enzymes, if they're having GI issues, um, I'm not against digestive enzymes. I don't think most dogs need them. Um, if I have a dog on chemotherapy, I like to keep them on a probiotic just to kind of keep the gut happy. Um, and then if they're having diarrhea or soft stool as a side effect of chemotherapy, I'm going to increase their um, probiotics from a maintenance to a daily while they're on it. Um, yeah, there are so many different things, and I agree, it gets really, really um, confusing. There is uh, uh, curcumin, which is from turmeric, in the Apicap supplement, so that's there. Um, if they have detectable mass cell tumor, whether it's multiple masses, then I am going to, yes, that's how you pronounce Apicaps. Um, Apicaps is a, and I'll come back to that, too many things to come back to, um, but um if they have detectable mast cell tumor, big mass, multiple masses, or spread, those are the dogs that I'm having on an antacid and an antihistamine. Um, 
those are the main ones. I love fish oils, guys. Why do we love fish oils? They have an anti-inflammatory effect. So the omega-3 fatty acids. I like Nordic Naturals. There's a lot of great brands out there. Um, so why are they called apicaps? Is because they promote apoptosis, which is cell suicide, which sounds bad, right? But you know, when our cells get damaged due to age or you know radiation or just anything that goes on, our cells should automatically go through a normal cell suicide mode. One of the things that cancer cells do is they keep dividing the little boogers and they don't die. They don't go into cell suicide. And so some of these natural supplements, including um, one of the components of green tea, help promote apoptosis. That's why they name them apicaps. Um, so that's how you pronounce it. So Mike or MJ, you, you got something out of tonight, hopefully. Um, Debbie, you asked a great question. So you had a dog with an intermediate grade two mast cell tumor with a high mitotic index. So there's a, the cutoff for being high, depending on what study you look at, is five to seven. And so 14 would definitely be considered high. So I w your question is, would I keep the dog on Tagamet or Benadryl? To me, I'm more concerned about the greater risk of metastasis. Um, and so that would be a dog I would love to do a mast cell tumor panel. I would want to stage. What does that mean? Do check, uh, sorry ultrasound, um, feel the lymph nodes that drain that area to make sure it hasn't spread. Um, and it definitely get that mast cell tumor panel because that'd be a dog, you know, in one study, if they had a mitotic index over greater than five to seven, the survival time was three to four months versus if it was less than that, it was 30 months, which is two and a half years. So that does get me a little bit worried. Again, not one piece of the puzzle should we yay or nay a pet, but again, it, that's something that I say, you know what? I'm more concerned about the risk for spread. Let's get some more information. Has this cancer spread? Is this cancer more likely to spread? Should this dog be on chemotherapy? Um, if the tumor has been completely removed, just because it had a mitotic index of 14, I wouldn't keep the dog on those um, medications, in my opinion, in general. Um, all right, guys, it's 946. Um, has this been helpful? Um, can you have fish oils while going through chemo? Um, Courtney wanted to know in general. Yes, absolutely. But again, talk to your, your veterinarian, talk to your oncologist about that. Um, because that is definitely something, you know, you know, you want to tell them about supplements. Um, sometimes when you start them on fish oils, they get diarrhea. So I don't usually start fish oils the day I start chemo because if chemo is going to cause the diarrhea, I want to know what caused it. So I incrementally add the supplements kind of as we're going through therapy. So Courtney, in general, absolutely going to be safe, but definitely talk to your veterinarian, talk to your oncologist about that. Um, should vaccinations be postponed following mast cell tumor diagnosis, Fernando? Um, not necessarily. I mean, it depends on where you are. Like why we're doing chemo, if, say I'm planning on doing six months of chemo, I'm going to delay um, their vaccines till after that, especially most mature older dogs don't need their vaccines just because the calendar says it. Um, so I may delay their vaccines. Um, you know, rabies is required by law. And in our area, there is rabies in the wildlife. So I'm going to try to get that one, you know, into their, into the dog as soon as possible. Um, but say you had a dog with a low grade mast cell tumor that was completely removed and you were going into monitoring phase, phase and you weren't going to do any chemotherapy, maybe just do some supplements and things like that. And they're due for vaccine. I would, I don't postpone vaccines, but again, they also don't like ask your vet, which of the vaccines does my dog really need? Like, you know, in general, rabies is an important one. You can run parvo distemper titers. And if the titers are adequate, meaning they have adequate immunity, you may postpone that one. Um, you know, maybe they don't need lepto um, and things like that. So don't just find out which vaccines they're due for and spread them out maybe and talk to them and say, which is the one they're risk at, which can we delay and things like that and do the most important ones. Like, I don't like for my, you know, them to get kennel cough. That's a called a modified live vaccine. And so I prefer, you know, especially if they're not being boarded, let's hold off on that one. So again, talk to your veterinarian, which are the ones that they really need at that time and use the ones. But again, don't just say no vaccines just because they had cancer. Um, but while you're figuring stuff out or on chemo, maybe you're going to delay it and talk to, um, talk to your oncologist about that. Um, I had my dog. Yeah, I love canine immunity. So what is that? That is a Asian mushroom supplement that um, has a lot of cool sort of like boost the immune system, um, helps 
promote that cell suicide, helps get some of the immune system cells, hopefully targeting those cancer cells. And it's a chewable tab. You can get it on Amazon. Again, tell your oncologist, your veterinarian that you're going to do it, but I really like that one. The other one um, that's on the market is called I Immunity. It's a little bit more expensive. That's the one that was specifically studied for dogs with hemangiosarcoma. Um, they are proprietary blends, so it's hard to compare them. Um, but for most of my patients, especially to be economical, we stick with um, the Apicaps. I'm Canine Immunity Plus. I told you guys I'm really tired. I hope I didn't speak that many times tonight. I'm doing my best, I promise. Um, so, great. I'm glad that has helped. Um, hey, Stephanie. Um, how are you? Um, I think I missed Joyce's message on the webpage. Um, Joyce, heartworm preventative. Oh. See, thank you, Candace. So sometimes just lots of messages coming up. So yeah, heartworm preventative, flea and tick preventative. <laughs> I've had some of my patients get fleas and gosh, if has anyone ever had fleas in their house? Ugh. First of all, those little buggers can jump high. They can jump from the floor to your bed. Um, when I, when my boys were younger, we would read all these books about like animals and all of their super like things that they can do. And I, I think if like if a flea was a person or a person was a flea, like we'd be able to jump to a hundredth floor of a building. That's how, for the size of their body, how high they can jump. Point being is I don't want your dog to get fleas. I don't want your dog to get heartworm or things like that. So stay, in my opinion, stay up on their monthly preventatives um, and talk to your veterinarian about it and things like that. But I keep them on heartworm preventative, flea and tick preventative, and all of that good stuff. Um... Rachel, do I, you asked me if you should give Benadryl prior to a vaccine. I assume you're worried more or less about why we're using Benadryl for uh, mast cell tumors, but for a vaccine reaction. Uh, if they haven't had a vaccine reaction, I don't pre-medicate them. Um, I don't pre-medicate my own dog with Benadryl. I also don't vaccinate on a regular basis. Um, if they've had a vaccine reaction, you want to talk to your veterinarian, maybe about spacing out the vaccines and things like that. So, um, but just because if it has a mast cell tumor, you shouldn't need to give them Benadryl before their vaccine. I hope that makes sense. Um, all right, guys, we're going to be wrapping it up. I hope I answered most of your questions. If not, let throw them in the bottom of the comments. Um, Lynn wanted to know, apologize for backtracking. It's okay. I'm all over the place tonight. Um, and I really appreciate you guys sticking with me. Um, yes, so you wanted to know where they spread. And so another um, thing that um, we're doing on to answer your question, Lynn, and I promise I will, is we have been doing, I don't know if you guys have been noticing, but we're every couple of days for the theme of the month, we're putting out little information um, posts, you know, little graphics about it. And then once they're all out, there'll be an album. So if you want to kind of go back and learn about canine lymphoma, the highlights of it, it's in the photo section in the albums. And so... Um, same thing for cat lymphoma and all of the mast cell tumor ones will be there as well. Um, so, but again, that's a great way it kind of reviews that. But where do mast cell tumors spread? They typically go to the draining lymph node. So if your dog has one on their back leg, it may go to the lymph node. I don't know why I'm pointing to behind my knee behind my knee, um, it, it'll go to the draining lymph node and then the liver and spleen. Sometimes the lymph nodes in the abdomen, depending on where it was. Um, and in most advanced cases can go in the bone marrow. So if you did a bone marrow aspirate, you might see mast cell tumors there. Um, doesn't go to the lungs, which is really interesting. Most cancers in dogs and cats end up metastasizing or spreading to the lungs. And to kind of go back to what kind of follow-up I do for dogs with mast cell tumors, you know, once we're at the every four month and then maybe every six month checkup, don't forget to do chest x-rays, not necessarily because you're looking for the mast cell tumor to spread there, but because you're looking um, to, for general health screening, make sure the heart and lungs are okay and make sure that you're not finding spread of another cancer. So um, I personally, twice a year, for a healthy middle-aged and older dog, we'll do chest x-rays and ultrasound just because, like I said, for a lot of these internal cancers, it's really hard to find them. A couple of things, guys. These calipers will be available on my website and on Facebook. Um, so we have the digital calipers if you're interested. And then I think I did this last time. Don't leave. Don't leave. I'm back. Okay. Digital calipers, they're going to be available um, on my website and on Facebook, so that's super exciting. And look, guys, your own calipers. These are plastic ones if you don't feel like you need the other one. 
So you can measure your dog's lumps or bumps. You can find them. We're looking for lumps and bumps that are a centimeter. Remember, if the mass is the size of a pea and been there a month, go to your vet for an aspirate. Why wait? Aspirate. And then these are my favorite. I know I'm such a geek. I, like I told you, like I like cytology. I like looking at cells under the microscope. These are pens. So they're functional pens that work and they have little calipers on them. Pretty cute. I love these. So anyway, you know, if you really want to be able to measure your pets, lumps and bumps, and then with the combination of the skin maps that are going to be on my website, hopefully by the end of next week, you can really do a great job keeping track of the lumps and bumps, which are the benign ones, which are the ones we need to be concerned about. What size are they? Again, this big, this big, that's not going to be really good. So again, some cool stuff um, that we can find. We'll be doing giveaways at some point in the near future, I know. So anyway, thanks, everybody. Um, I really appreciate you guys coming. I, was this helpful? Um, I really, really hope if it was, give me a heart, give me a, a yes, because that uh, makes me feel good. Um, and um, I really appreciate you guys, like I said, spending your Thursday night with me. I'm going to go give my boys a kiss goodnight, which they should be in sleep by now because it's uh, totally past their bedtime and I bet you they are up. So thank you guys so much. Um, Caitlin um, DeWild, who is my um, coordinator and she just helps me. She is an awesome, super fantastic veterinarian and friend of mine and she helps me organize all this social media stuff. Um, we are going to be picking um, a date. Um, I'm going to, Thursday nights work best for me and I hope that works well for you guys. It's the end of the week for me. Um, so probably going to be sticking with Thursday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. on the West Coast. Um, if anybody has a huge preference for another day, um, we will probably do one during the day as well. And again, if you can't make it, you know, you can always, um, join us, um, watch the replay, but just, Hey, tell me in the comments, do you like day, night, and what day of the week you like? Um, because we will take everything into consideration. Go, you know, look out for the mast cell tumor information, share them, tag your friends in them. The more people that we can really get to know about cancer, we can demystify this whole process, make it less scary and find these lumps and bumps sooner. So again, thank you guys. I really, really appreciate your taking the time to, you know, out of your busy lives to come join me for this. And that's it guys. Uh, thank you so much. Have a great weekend. And in the month of May, we'll be talking about bone cancer. So thanks, everybody. Really appreciate it. Have a good one.